morning, everyone. If I can have you take your seats, please. That was not highly effective. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Can I have you take your seats, please? That worked a little better. Next on our agenda is our 2022 WPSA lecture, and I would like to introduce uh, Sammy Dridi, the USA branch president, and Bruce Rathgaber, the Canadian branch president, to do the introduction for our speaker. Thank you and enjoy the talk. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is really nice to see you here today after two years of uh, pandemic. Before I introduce uh, our speakers with us, I would like to share with you a few slides. Just a reminder, and I think all of you know that the WPC will be held in August 7 to 11 in, in Paris, and I hope to see you all there. And I would like also to thank the WPSA board members that uh, work so hard to organize this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, Todd Applegate, Darren uh, Karcher, Tony Piscator, Pitek Sitar, Robert Van Wy, Francine Bradley, and Bob Buresh. I would like also to thank the WPSA Canada uh, group, and I'll let Bruce introduce his team. Yeah, we're happy to do this in partnership each year, and, and uh, likewise, we have a, a group of members that uh, help make sure the, the organization runs here in, or not here, but in Canada. Um, we have our secretary, Deborah Adewale, Sasha Vanderklein, I'm not sure if she's here. Um, Vicky Couture, our newsletter editor. Uh, John Mark, uh, as well as Brenda, Stephanie Collins, Anna, Wendy Clark, Tony, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> my eyes and my brain are not working together and Helen Ann, and uh, so we have a fairly large group there as well. I would like also to congratulate our four awardees for the Car Center SA 2020 or 2022. We have three from UC Davis, uh, Andra, uh, Andrea uh, Dirogatis, Alejandra Figueroa, and Linda from UC uh, Davis, and Alison Ramsar from the University of Arkansas. Now, I, it is a great pleasure to, uh, uh, for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ayan Ban, who visited us from uh, Rosen Institute, and he's going to talk about the quality and strength of bone in laying hands. And I think this is a timely and a hot spot research topic for all of us, whether from academia or from industry. Uh, Dr. Dan is a, a professor and personal chair of avian biology and the group leader at the Rosen Institute, as I said, and the Royal School of Vet Studies, University of Edinburgh, Scotland. He got a BS in physiology and pharmacology in 1983 from the University of St. Andrews and a PhD in molecular biology in 1993 from Open University and he did a postdoc at the Children's Hospital at Harvard, Boston. He has been working in poultry for more than 40 years. I think initially he started working with uh, deep vectoral myopathy in, in, in hands and then neuroendocrine control of reproduction, and lately he moved to the genetics and uh, quantitative uh, genetics to locate 
chromosomal region controlling egg quality, broadiness, and bone strength. He has more than 120 publications. And I did a quick search on the web of science. He has more than 5,480 citation and H index of 43. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dan. Dear. It doesn't look as if the, the subscription <laughs> has been paid. <laughs> Sorry, I have a hard, hard time with the mouse. Well, while, while we're waiting, uh, it's absolutely great to be here. Uh, and particularly talking on behalf of the WPSA, which is an organization I have a great deal of uh, fondness for, for what it does in terms of uh, education, outreach, and uh, so on across the world. Um, I'm going to first start with an apology. Um, I've uh, just had my fourth booster shot in what the immunologists would say was with a live unattenuated vac uh, virus. So I have a slight sore throat, but uh, no viral particles apparently. So uh, if I do dry up, I will endeavor to get past that and I'll be embarrassed for all of you. So don't worry, uh, I'll, I'll take that uh, burden. So, as I say, I, I think it is timely to be talking about this. And uh, the reason I started with what's effectively my acknowledgement slide is because it's at least 25 years of work that's led us to this point. And I've put some of the names there uh, that have helped that and some of the funding organizations that have contributed along the way. Uh, and in particular, I think I would mention Lohman Breeding, who have allowed access to chickens uh, and indeed set up lines of chickens specifically to answer questions. Um, so as I say, I think it's quite fitting to be here in the United States of America or the north, northern part of the United States, uh, sorry, American continent. Uh, geography is not great. Um, because I think it's in a way because of the move in away from cages in this part of the world that has made this more uh, topical again. I mean, it's obviously well underway in Europe uh, but um, if I had money for every time somebody told me, oh, it'll never happen in the United States, uh, I clearly I could cash in my chips now and be relatively well off for that. So I say I'm going to talk about genetics and genetic inspired solutions. So I'll start with some information on why we do the work why avian bone is, is different, um, particularly the adaption to laying eggs. Uh, I'll touch on the question of it's all because hens have been selected for increased egg production, which I don't believe is correct. Um, 
I'll then touch on some approaches to improve bone health by genetics, nutrition, management, and of course, uh, selection, so, uh, well, genetics. And then some maybe not so wise conclusion, but anyway, hopefully the facts will be interesting. So why do we work on bone health in laying hens? Well, uh, it probably doesn't need to be introduced here, and we had a breakfast that had a large number of scrambled eggs in it. Um, it's an, they're an extremely economical source of protein and balanced source of protein for uh, nutrition of humans. Uh, and in some countries, uh, as you can see here, are, are really eaten in quite large quantities. Um, so that's why we work on it. It's uh, a major industry, of course. But bone quality is uh, a welfare issue in laying hens. There's a high prevalence of bone fracture at slaughter. Often, of course, that's during the harvesting of the hens, but uh, it's particularly, of course, now seen as being exacerbated by non-cage environments, so aviary, for example. And so I would argue that the evidence that this is an issue for chickens is actually poor. Um, the precautionary principle would say that we should try and avoid it, and certainly public opinion is of that opinion. So we have problems, as is in the keel bone there, with some deviation, and you see some, uh, the, the little fracture is actually something that we did at post-mortem, but uh, that's, that's the reason that we do it. And I'm really just recapping here, why is this attracting more attention now? It's because we have these changes in housing and increased concern about hen welfare. People do not want to be eating food that they worry that the animal that produced that food was kept badly. And then there's what I've called the long life layer. I claim to have come up with that term, but anyway, uh, again, it was before its time, so it never really caught on. Uh, but hens are now being kept for 100 weeks uh, successfully. So it was seen that this could be a greater risk for uh, bone damage. Whether it is, that's another matter. And maybe particularly importantly, we've got changes in selection technology. Uh, genome selection is here, and it means you can produce much more uh, pressure on traits if you wish. Hopefully, it may also mean that traits like bone quality can be included in selection indexes. So what are the consequences for bone damage in the move from cages to alternative systems? Now, uh, in this case, you can see, if I can read my own slide, uh, if you look at the mean breaking strength, this is work done by Victoria Sanderlands, a colleague uh, in Scotland, although originally from Canada. Um, and she showed that, as is the case in every study, more or less, that's ever been done, if you move birds from cages into alternative systems, they will have stronger bones. So, great. But if you look at the number of bone breakages, it's greater in the alternative system than it is in the cage. And this is generally assumed because they have much more ability to bump into things, they fly, uh, you know, I, people say chickens don't fly, but I can tell you in an aviary, they at least make an attempt at it. Uh, and I've seen some perching in some pretty high spots on cables, God only knows what. So the result, again, the big fracture is us, but you can see the deformation and fracture or increased uh, bone density with callus formation in this keel. 
The good thing is some years ago, two lines were created, high and low bone strength using retrospective selection. This is work that colleagues of mine did before I uh, got involved in this work. And you can see that if you compare aviary with cage, the, um, the high bone strength line is always better than the low bone strength line, whether it's keel density or breaking strength of the tibia. Um, but of course, uh, the, there is that difference between aviary and cage. So uh, the genetics, we would argue, seems to work in both environments. So in a sense, what we actually have is a welfare paradox, another welfare paradox. Uh, poultry science seems to be full of them. Um, the efforts to improve hen welfare uh, come with a cost. Uh, and this is in the overall setting that we're trying to increase the productivity of agriculture, lengthening the period of egg production to feed a growing population. So if we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater and keep these uh, welfare benefits, uh, we need uh, solutions to the keel bone, bone quality issue. So in, in a sense, our research objectives over the, well, not even me, but my predecessors uh, has been to actually try and improve bone quality by reducing fracture and damage by genetic selection. And in part, along the way, we have to understand what's important in terms of the causes of poor bone quality, both genetic and physiological. Um, and the big problem is to develop a realistic measurement of bone quality that breeders can use in practice. And that's always been the problem because we had to kill the chickens and that's not the most effective way of being fertile if you're dead. So we had to come up with something and we'll touch on that um, later. But this has led to also on the way, we've got a couple of non-genetic solutions potential or practical. I just want to touch on what we do to measure bone quality, and this is why, of course, it's useless at the moment for genetic selection. We take out usually the tibia, the humerus, or tibial turfus, and the keel bone or sternum. We can measure their radiological uh, density by, uh, as you can see, uh, oops, we can also measure breaking strength of the long bones, but it's extremely time consuming. And it's of course at the end of lay. Okay, so what is different about avian bones? Well, this is a slide from a colleague Bob Fleming. Uh, nice pictures of the osteoclasts, uh, the multinucleate cells, I'm not sure if I, does this show up? No. Um, nucleic cells that you can see absorbing bone and the osteoblasts laying down bone. Nothing particularly unusual there, same as in mammals. The difference is chickens lay, and birds in general, lay hard-shelled eggs. And as you can see, it takes quite a lot of calcium carbonate, calcium, which is it at least in part, buffered by medullary bone. Um, of course, it ultimately has to come from the diet and the diet has to uh, produce enough for the shell. But as you can see, it's quite a considerable amount of calcium and just nothing like a paper from the 1950s to keep up to date. You can see that egg just being turned uh, through 180 degrees before it's... Uh, laid. 
now we've got new technology. I'm desperate to revisit uh, this, but anyway, that's another story. And so it's all about medullary bone, the specialized bone that is in the middle of the long bones and actually in the middle of the keel as well, um, that is produced under the influence of estrogen from the ovary. So we get a complete change in the bone physiology. Um, and this is, of course, an adaptation to egg laying. And it's that um, switch, I mean, a, a fascinating biological b issue uh, that makes the, the big difference for a laying hen. And the general hypothesis over time has been that the osteoclasts can continue not only absorbing medullary bone, which they do once every 24 hours to provide calcium, um, and then the osteoblasts lay down medullary bone, uh, but they remove structural bone as well. And this can result in osteoporosis and laying hens, and I've uh, repeated this mantra many times. But is it entirely true? You know, chickens wouldn't be standing if it was true, I think, uh, at the end of a laying period. And I, I rapidly began to doubt this. Not rapidly, it took me a long time, actually. Uh, and this is where the, you know, the mantra, it's all because hens have been selected for increased egg production comes from. But where is that evidence? Um, I'm very glad to be treading in the footsteps of Charles Darwin when in it, uh, ooh, when was it, 1868, just yesterday, he looked at uh, the keel bones of uh, a range of hens and uh, what was it, 88% of those keels were what he described as uh, crooked, oh no, that was Warren that was described them as crooked. Uh, he described them as uh, uh, had deformities. Warren, who in the 1940s, who went on, I think, to set up poultry, big breeder poultry, I think, uh, I can just about remember Warren chickens. Um, he described the genetics of crooked keels. So this is not a new phenomenon of today. It's been there for a long time. And in, in case of Darwin, he was interested in the hypothesis of disuse because no longer needing to fly, the keel bone, which is the attachment for the flight muscles, was beginning to uh, atrophy effectively in an evolutionary sense. And if you compare lines of hen that lay uh, different amounts of eggs, sometimes, yes, the higher laying line is worse, but often not. But one thing's for sure, if you don't lay eggs, if you're a chicken, that is, and you don't lay eggs, uh, you will have much better bones. So, and the most extreme example is a male, which clearly doesn't lay eggs and has extremely good bone keel quality. But it's not the same as saying laying more eggs is a problem. And this is just one, I could use a slide like this from almost all the data we collected over the years. You can see that in the sort of main distribution of egg production in a flock of pure line hens, uh, it's just a cloud. There's no clear correlation. Yes, if the birds have had extremely low production, so probably long period without laying eggs, they tend to be better across at the left of the graph. But in general, it's not the case. And there are birds that lay a lot of eggs and have good quality bones. Okay. Um, if you remember from the start, I'm not really a geneticist. Uh, I am uh, maybe a physiologist, uh, probably a poultry scientist, covers most things. Uh, and so I will just introduce these terms for the simple reason I know I needed that help myself. So heritability is the amount of variance that genetics explains. 
genetic correlation is the proportion of variation that two traits share due to genetic causes. So classically, it could be the same genes. On extreme cases, it just could be two genes are close together. And voluntary food intake and growth are two quite classically, at least if you're a mouse, are classically tightly linked uh, traits. So here, heritability is on the diagonal in the sort of black bo uh, boxes and genetic correlation is below the diagonal. And I need to slightly take you through this. The panel on the right of early and late is to do with egg production. The early part is the first eight weeks. At the beginning, no chickens are laying eggs. At the end, they're all laying eggs. So basically, it defines puberty. The less eggs, the later puberty. And the late part is persistence. You've got two lines of chicken, one a white egg layer, a white leghorn, and the other a Rhode Island red. And if you can see, the genetic correlation, uh, well, first of all, there's quite good genetic uh, heritability for bone strength. And this is typically what we've seen around about 40% of the variation in bone quality is genetic. Repeatedly over the years, that's what we've seen. So it's really quite important if we could select on it. Sorry, if we could select on it. Are you still able to hear me at the back? I'm just getting a wee bit uh, rough. Okay, so if you see in both lines, there is no genetic correlation. If anything, it's going the wrong way. There is, oops, there is though in the white leghorn quite a considerable genetic correlation between early egg production, therefore puberty, and bone quality. So the later you lay eggs, start laying eggs, the better your bone quality will be. And this is almost certainly all tied up with uh, body weight. You can see that, of course, the later you come in to lay, the heavier you will be. So significant genetic correlation in the white leghorn between body weight and uh, puberty, shall we call it. Uh, so here's a potential intervention point. You can potentially change puberty uh, by non-genetic means. And I indulge myself by going back somewhat in time to the panel on the left, you can in fact keep chickens, albeit these were uh, broiler breeders, you can keep them out of lay for a year. And then by diet, bring them into lay. And of course, on the right, you can influence the onset of lay by light. I'm not suggesting you do the thing on the left, probably wouldn't be allowed to do it in the UK anymore anyway, but uh, you know, it is possible. So that's one intervention point. Here is one in the nutrition field that hopefully will be of interest. As I said, 40% of the variation in genetics is explained, uh, sorry, 40% of the variation in bone quality is explained by genetics. And that was, uh, sort of an index that included humerus, tibia, and keel bone. Uh, and a little bit of negative for body weight, because as you saw, there's a tendency you could just end up with heavier chicken. So we didn't want that. So after, and I'm saying we, because I had absolutely nothing to do with this, uh, it was before my involvement, but they, got divergent selection and got birds that differed in bone quality. So by generation seven, there was a considerable difference in the quality of bone. 
and we took the two lines and we could do a classic uh, study to look at uh, genetic loci. We didn't have a lot of markers then, but we had a nice QTL. And because we still had access to the founder population, which was a commercial pure line, we were able to go back um, 12 years after the initial selection. So living long is helpful in poultry science, you can see, uh, because we could still go back. And uh, you can see here we had a nice tight uh, QTL. And just for information, this marker is the one you'll see in a couple of later slides. So it, we could select the birds purely on that genotype in the founder generation. Again, five generations further on. You can see really quite a big difference in bone strength between the uh, different alleles, uh, genotypes. And luckily, well, maybe not luckily for the chickens, but luckily for us, the uh, genotype that was least represented uh, had the worst bones. So the, pr the potential for improvement is quite large. We were able to go again into that population, pick out birds we wanted for our RNA-seq analysis. So to try and find out the gene responsible. So we were looking in the tibia, maybe naive, because who knows where it might have been acting, but we were lucky. Uh, you can see there's no difference in body weight, no difference in egg production, but cortical bone, medullary bone density, quite different between the two uh, homozygous uh, sets of animals. Um, now, if any of you have done RNA-seq, you sort of think, oh God, what's all this? But we were kind of lucky. There was four genes different. They were all uh, right at the loci. And the one with the biggest effect is something called cystathione beta synthase. Excuse me. So um, that's it, really, you know, thousands of pounds of money and that's your result. Um, and that was, you know, I mean, we did this on the cheap. <laughs> uh, you can see here in our confirmation with a lot more animals, big difference in the expression between the two uh, homozygous uh, set. Um, and if you have a heterozygote, you could see, luckily there were sort of markers we could use, you could see quite clearly it was cis-acting. So in other words, it was something on the uh, same chromosome nearby that, uh, because the A allele is expressing more than the G. Um, there, so here is a sort of stylized pathway for where cystathione beta synthase CBS acts. It's in the one carbon pathway. So kind of really important to all you nutritionists out there. Uh, so I believe. Um, and it is involved in the recovery of methionine, uh, or rather, you know, its precursor homocysteine can be remethylated to methionine, which I think is a limiting amino acid in laying hens, if I'm not mistaken. But the main thing is that the substrate levels, homocysteine, were different between the two genotypes. And it it wasn't too difficult to find in the literature that homocysteine is involved in bone quality. And probably through cross-linking of collagen molecules, which of course are 
a key part of uh, bone. Um, and so we hypothesized that by act targeting that pathway, we could improve bone quality. And so we did this. Uh, this was funded by AB Vista, actually, very kindly. Uh, even though they didn't at the time sell betaine, but anyway. Um, you could see clearly by feeding betaine, which is trimethylglycine, I uh, don't know, um, it's called betaine because it's a byproduct of sugar production, I think. Um, you can see we were able to reduce homocysteine and improve tibia breaking strength and radiographic density. So uh, we like to think that this is genetics that has led to a potentially nutritional solution. And there are other ways of intervening in this pathway, which are certainly we're going to look at. And you can see it's not on the scale as maybe of the genetic potential, but we were able to see around about an eight Newton increase in bone strength. So we have puberty and diet as potential management and nutritional interventions. But what about direct genetic improvement? That's ar arguably where the biggest effects might be. So we, I mean, again, it's good to have young people because they come up with new ideas because we're all set in our ways. And technology for things like radiography is, it's just so different to what it was five years ago, 10 years ago. You can do live bird x-rays, takes us from cage to uh, back to cage, 40 seconds. We can make a estimate of tibia density. Uh, so, you know, we believe we can do this. It's highly reproducible. So if you look, the amount of variance in our study is around 86% is due to the bird. So in other words, there's very little variation comes from the method. We repeatedly measure the bird. We use different operators. Um, it's, it's really trivial. But maybe more clearly, you can see here the estimates of tibia density for individual hens in our, I think, 60 hens, just uh, so clear delineation between the individuals. So ideal for genetics that you can differentiate animals, basically. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. If you look here, we're seeing correlations between post-mortem breaking strength and what we've called the tibia area under the curve. Now, they're not perfect, but then neither is comparison between, say, you know, radiographic density and tibia strength. And at the end of the day, they're all proxies for, I suppose, trying to reduce breakage in the animal. So we think this is adequate. If you play around with calcium and phosphorus in the diet within three weeks, which is a lot faster than you can do by post-mortem type study, you can see differences in bone quality in hens. And for FAR, which is we were food and Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, funded this. Um, uh, and you can see uh, it, it definitely picks up changes in bone quality. And we did a study through life, at least the life that this chicken had, which was only up to about 60 or 70 weeks of age. 
And you can actually see that uh, although the bird continues to put on weight over that time, uh, bone density appears to pretty much plateau. And that feeds a bit into the story uh, originally that the egg laying or the amount of egg laying probably isn't the key issue because a lot of people were seeing that bone quality or bone damage was occurring early in lay, uh, which didn't really fit with the concept of uh, progressive osteoporosis. Um, one thing though is for sure, the, I don't think that egg uh, bone quality before lay is much of a predictor of bone quality after. Uh, and I think that's because you basically throw all the cards in the air with puberty. And we all know puberty can be difficult. And clearly there's genetic influences, there's body weight influences. It, there doesn't seem to be much relationship, which was disappointing, but that seems to be the truth. So, ah, yes, but is it any good for selection? Well, you can see here that it, three ages in a pedigree flock, 0.45 for anything in the genetic sphere for farm animals is pretty damn good. Um, and the genetic correlation between ages at 0.9 is really helpful because you're only gonna need to make this measurement once in life, or at least a chicken's life. So that saves a lot of effort and uh, is hopefully going to make it all the more likely to be implemented. I should say this was is work done by Bjorn Anderson. At, uh, he's using all the data we produce for his PhD. So um, hopefully that will come out soon, as will the method, which is just in final uh, final review. So, for those of you that thought all the problem was with the keel bone, and this is an example from a chicken at Roslyn, we keep them on a, a compromised diet for all the different types of chickens we have, and we have a lot of keel bone, bone distortion, as you can see in this x-ray. But one way I'd like to convince you that if we select on the tibia, we'll improve the keel, is he uh, here we've got keel bone scoring. So damage gets worse as the number gets higher. And you can see that the tibia breaking strength is a lot lower in the worst group. So correlation between tibia and keel bone damage. And the problem is that keels that are damaged have a lot higher density due to the fracture callus. And this is actually why getting genetic parameters from keels today is really difficult because birds are often kept in furnished cages uh, where they damage themselves. So in fact, we haven't seen a decent heritability for keel for many years. But when we did, so this is going back a little bit, there was clearly genetic correlation between tibia strength and keel bone radiographic density. <coughs> So that gives us strong belief that using the tibia will help. And again, when you look at the incidence of fractures against keel bone radiographic density, there's a clear uh, correlation. The better the density, the less number of fractures. <coughs> Almost there. 
Um, there is also other measures of keel bone that may, we have done, and we are beginning to get sensible measures from live bird x-ray. So going back to Darwin's disuse hypothesis, maybe we could make the keel smaller. It's, uh, you know, possible. And there is clearly genetic correlation between the depth and, in this case, humerus or tibia density. Uh, and anyway, there's, there's potential there. So, to conclude, at least, okay, three slides to go, I think. There's considerable genetic variation for bone quality, which definitely can be a target for genetic selection. But having a practical phenotype is key to that. Uh, and we think uh, we have a very strong candidate and it's really just now trying to get that into practice. There are, of course, hurdles. For me, it's very difficult to support the hypothesis that the number of eggs that a hen lays is really the ultimate cause of bone problems. And I think this is important because we need to go after the correct things, not the incorrect ones. There's no point wasting time following a dogma if there's no evidence for that dogma. Um, age at first egg, puberty, though almost certainly has an influence on bone quality. <coughs> I don't think though you'll get breeders trying to reduce that. Well, I might be wrong, but because there is a lot of pressure in the EU on breeders uh, that there could be legal sanctions if they don't do something. Um, from the point of view of studying or chasing a QTL, which is what we did, and I suppose a QTL now might be a genome-wide association study, uh, we've demonstrated that there is some used to that because a lot of people just say gee was it's a waste of time if all you do is produce a list of genes nobody's going to use them nobody's they might read the paper if you're lucky but if you can demonstrate something useful with that fair enough variation in the cystathione beta synthase gene does have an effect on bone quality, quite, quite large, but there are many larger loci uh, with larger effect. So maybe we can find other useful things. We think it's through collagen cross-linking, uh, but yet to be proven. We've changed homocysteine levels and they did have an effect. So there's more that can be done. And as you can see, the marker alone could increase depending on you know, which estimate you use, six to 18%. So direct genetic solutions are one approach to this problem, but they have to be targeted at the right things and I've said this already. So age of puberty, body weight, these are things that can be manipulated when hens come into lay to try and alleviate this problem. Egg number, I don't think is the story, no, completely. But for sure, we should not think that genetics is the only solution. We need to tackle nutrition, housing, they're all important. Uh, and I think that's true of many things. You know, there's not a single solution. It's many approaches are needed to optimize the welfare of this long life layer that we're going to have, uh, with, is with us, uh, and not throw out the benefits of extensive production uh, or alternative production. So I think that's me. Hopefully it's been useful. Uh, so thank you.
Thank you so much for a very insightful talk. We do have a few minutes for questions. For those of you who are used to online stuff, don't look for the chat box or the Q&A part. You'll have to actually um, indicate in person that you have a question. Um, do we have microphones? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Hi, the Mercedes Basket for Novice International. Gr great talk. Thank you uh, for the review. A uh, very interesting topic. Do you think um, bone mass, bone mass at puberty, could have an implication allowing that animal to have longer bones later in life? Is that a critical yeah, yeah, aspect? Yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, if I wasn't explicit, I guess that's exactly what I mean. We've always said, perhaps without the greatest of proof, that the better the bone quality when a hen comes into life, the better it will be through life. Uh, as I say, I sometimes wonder how good our evidence for that statement, but that's exactly what we believe. So, yes. so do you think poverty, uh, puberty uh, diets to induce higher bone mass are maybe yeah, getting the animal the right? Exactly. I know that well, I think past nutritionists at uh, Highline, I'm sure it was what they had tried to tell their customers all the time. Don't skimp on the pre whatever it is they put in the diet stuff. Get them uh, to have the best quality bones at the onset of lay. I know there are potentially risks of, I don't know, layer urolithiasis and so on, but I think you know, uh, I suspect there's a, farmers may well think, oh, we don't need this. Uh, we can skimp on pre-layered diet or whatever. So I think, yes, absolutely key. But at the same time, potentially pushing back lay a little bit may help. But you know, these are things that need to be worked out. Uh, arguably, they probably have been worked out if one was to look in the literature. Dice, ¿cómo en práctica con un equipo to use a 2% calcium diet from 16 to 19 and even 20 weeks of age, which means that the hens might be even above 20% production? How can influence that at, uh, at the end of the cycle, let's say in hens with 60 to 90 weeks of age? Oh, I'll be honest, I'm not sure that's an area of my expertise. So that's to do with the diet Calcium. The amount of calcium because these hens are putting an egg every day. Yes. So I mean, I guess, I, I think I would be disingenuous if I try and actually answer that in detail. What I would say is, I think if they, I think what actually happens is it's not an increase, it's not a flock decrease it's increased variance in the flock. So some birds will be really crap. Whether you can bring those back, I don't know. Maybe feeding more calcium, but they have, to, if, if they've got some gastrointestinal problem, are they gonna absorb that calcium? I don't know. We are two already that we don't know, so thank you. Yes, <laughs> sorry. I, w I would be, Oh, go ahead. Did you have something else to finish? Uh, nothing that was of any <laughs> use. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Lisa Bilkey, I'm at OSU. Um, so, I was kind of headed in the same place that Mercedes was a minute ago with the pre-puberty setup. But, but the additional question I have on that is, do you tend to see deformities at the puberty stage, or do those not, the bone deformities that we see, like the keel bones, do you see that already at that young age, or do those manifest later? I'm thinking more as, as a selection tool yeah, for, for um, your genetics. We're certainly going to try and look at that. The trouble is, if you look in the commercial pure lines, they tend to be kept 
in a different place, so it's harder to access them. And it's a long way of saying, in commercial pure lines, we have not looked. <laughs> in our own birds, in our own facility, um, we see not a lot of damage, to be honest, if they're fed the correct, correct stuff, if they're fed as they would be, if they were feeding them like the example I showed, for sure you'll get uh, damage right from the beginning. So I th again, I don't think I can say, and it, it depends on the environment. If there's no perches and anything, you know, you don't see much damage. So you almost have to have some challenge to see it. And this is why we had problems with the furnished cages. Thank you, Ian. It's a very interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering ab about the factors of, of exercise during puberty, and because uh, we're finding that um, raising birds and rearing aviaries versus conventional cages, you get profound effects on the size, the shape, the strength of the bones. And I'm wondering if in the birds that you are studying, what kind of environment do you keep them in? And is there very much variation or opportunity for exercise? Uh, yes, yeah, so the ones we keep at Roslyn, uh, they are on the floor. They have vi minimal, well, of course, they still find places to fly to, but officially, not just a, p a single perch. Um, and if, as I say, if they're fed the right diet, they're pretty good. Um, so what would I say? Uh, I mean, yes, we definitely see that improvement of cage versus aviary setting. So, yeah, we definitely a good benefit from being able to exercise. There's no doubt. I mean, uh, that's something, I mean, it's really, if it's a good thing to study because, you know, studying things that are only a few percent, not really worth it, but uh, exercise affects really quite a large effect. So if, if I was starting my career, do something like that, because not when you're dealing with 5% and you need 2,000 birds to prove a point. So yes, I think, uh, so yet ours normally have exercise, but I think that's also true of the pure lines. They're raised on the floor, but then they go into cages for recording, of course. Although some, of course, nowadays are kept in free range and tracked. So, you know, we've got, we will be looking at that to make, because there is some evidence that some of the genes active on the floor are different from those in the cage, which is a pain, but. I think we have time for one more, and then I would encourage you to hunt Dr. Dunn down in the hallway and, and have a conversation with him. Unfortunately, we have only time for one more. So on this dogma with uh, selection for egg production or body weight, have you, have you thought about expanding out to some of the other research populations that exist? So you look at Carl Nestor has turkey lines selected for and against egg production. You've got Paul Siegel that has lines selected for and against body weight that differ in egg production. Nick Anthony had lines at Arkansas. Uh, Sammy has lines at, at Georgia. So I think there's a, a lot of lines out there that you could test this hypothesis with these QTLs. Yeah. Um, if I'm honest, uh, I would not be that interested in looking at lines that are not commercially used. I mean, we work on the lines that are used to make the birds that people use. If people want to look at those and prove, I mean, I, you know, personally, I, I think the strength is to work on the birds that are actually used in practice. And I know there are many lines that are of interest, but I mean, if you take Paul Siegel's lines, the low growth one, I think it's, got, you know, a lot of retroviral issues and things. So, you know, I, I think I wouldn't, I personally believe that working on the birds that are actually used in 
commercial practice are the best thing you can do. Sorry to be disappointing. Well, thank you very much for the questions and for your presentation this morning. I see it stirred up a lot of uh, thoughts among our members. Thank you to Poultry Science Association for giving us this time to have the WPSA lecture once again at the start of the, uh, uh, the week. And uh, I'd ask you to join me one more time to thanking our uh, speaker this morning. Enjoy the meetings.